This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Our special guest today is Robert Ramos. Robert, thank you for hanging out with us today, man. Oh, I appreciate you having me. It's going to be a lot of fun. First podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Man. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. You're um, a little, I don't know if you're a different guest as much as, um, I mean, I don't know if you're, you're a software developer, right? You're, you're in the tech industry for sure, but you're not the one banging out the code. Correct. I don't have anything to do with um, code. I just kind of, I'm the CEO of the company, so I kind of have the ideas and other people do the, do the important work. All right. So give, give everybody the two minute spiel, the two minutes on, on the company you started and you've built and, and, and what you're doing. Okay. So I'm the uh, CEO of Agritech. Uh, Agritech was developed coming out of uh, COVID where uh, food security was identified as a huge problem um, through COVID, uh, through supply chains, logistics, things like that. I believe uh, countries realized that they weren't growing enough food uh, domestically to support their populations. And a lot of problems came from this. We were already working on a traceability uh, technology for uh, the commodity sector. I have an energy company as well out of Singapore. And in that was supposed to be a a peer to peer type of marketplace on the blockchain where we had a full provenance in the history of the product. So, for example, if we're trading oil or commodities, there has to be a vessel, an injection report, there has to be bank comfort letters or um, uh, debt instruments, things like that. What we did was by um, putting it all on the blockchain, we got to trace from the origin from the manufacturer where that bank document was was real the shipping document was real the um the logistics reports were real so that any anybody could buy with confidence on that platform and the only way to get on the platform is through a secure user id uh, interface with the blockchain so the bank officer or the inspection officer or the logistics officer would have to literally log on. So we would see where the breakdowns are. There'd be no more broker, broker uh, nonsense, no more fraud, no more fake documents. That would all be eliminated as you have to have a secure interface to get on there. So if you can't get on there to view those documents, it didn't work. So what we did was when the G20 and the um, UN Food um, Security Council met in Indonesia, we were part of a team that went down there trying to help find a solution. So all we did was just move this over to the food uh, industry. So now we're dealing with agriculture to include livestock. So from the food, uh, the farmer, all the way to the consumer, whether it's uh, through a restaurant or through a processing center, the food would get uh, delivered or would be identified where it was grown, expected harvest, harvest date, inspection certification, uh, it, whether or not it has GMP, GACP certification, or if it has GAP, cert, whatever certification is required, onto the processing facility, onto the restaurant, or onto the consumer. So it mitigated the uh, need for brokers. So these small farmers that grow in a community and then have to go to a uh, end of the road or some sort of farmer's market to offload their produce, we instantly gave them access peer to peer globally. So anybody that can get onto a, a system can see what's being sold. So you can literally buy products from around the world without having to go through a broker just on a direct peer to peer. So if you have an import license and I have an export license, we can connect without having to deal with these broker chains that take a lot of the revenue um, in the markups and things like that. So, you know, they're called global value chains, but you know, they're just brokers. This is a logistics nightmare. I've worked on some of this stuff, Robert. Um, I've worked on the just getting a farmer to stop doing what they're doing to to enter data is a nightmare, right? You've got to find really inventive ways not to slow them down. So, um, I've I've heard of these products before. So, do you have any of this actually working right now? 
So the traceability is what we started with. So that was basically, so the first part is done, which is the application. And, and right now we're starting to load the farmers up. And you're right, the first thing is writing something where the farmer will take time to actually input the data. The problem with farms is that the revenue is so bad. So unless we find them markets, the farming industry is just going away. And this is how what COVID identified people realize they have to do it. So you have countries like Singapore, for example, that have this 2030 program where they're infusing a lot of government money to get people to start producing their own food. So by 2030, instead of only producing 10% of their food, they can get up to say 50, 60% of the food. And the only way to do that is to subsidize and to offer people something as far as value and revenue to actually want to farm. So in a sense, you have to kind of make farming you know, sexy again, where people are producing food, but you also have to give them a place to offtake it. Producing the food without them being dependent on government subsidies or government uh, buying it, you know, just for their communities, it, it's kind of pointless and it'll, it'll wind up going back to the same place it was. So what we're trying to do is connect that end user to give them access to the consumer directly. I, I, I'm curious how big of a team you have right now working on this problem. 10 10 devs or just overall overall 10 yeah. yes this is a massive problem yeah behind the uh behind the scenes so we worked on it for about a year used a company called science soft out of the us to, to write the scope of work so i'm a 30-year retired contracting officer and this is what we did right i also own a robotics company so breaking this stuff down was easy like i said we started with the commodities industry because being in the commodities it's littered with fraud. I mean, it's, it's horrible. So at least with the food, you're dealing with people who want food and people are trying to find a way to get it places. And you have a government supporting you and you have the UN um, World Food and you have the um, um, the Global uh, Agriculture Food Security Program and all this money coming in to go to these farms to actually build farms. But if you don't show them how to build a smart farming facility where that product, if you want to grow, say, Florida oranges, for example, that happen to import them, we can literally grow that in Ghana by putting a smart farming facility and mimic the, the conditions of that grow. So we already know this kind of works because we're doing cannabis in Thailand using the genetics uh, from California. Right, we're going to get back to this, Robert, because this is all fascinating and really difficult logistics. Like, like I don't know how you woke up one morning and said, let's work on this massive logistically based impossible tech problem right like yeah like, these are scary like they need to get done they're scary projects um i, I think they're scary projects but i i, I want to get back to how we get here at some point right the I, what i love is really talking to people and trying to to learn about how they got to where they are today so so i want to throw you into the time machine uh, and I want to kind of throw you back to uh, I'm going to throw you back into your freshman year in high school so tell me where you or first I got to date you to so first tell me when you graduated high school that's always a good a good question oh man I I graduated in uh, 1985 85 okay so you're a little older than I am Okay, all right, that's good. I I graduated in eighty seven, so you got two years there. I mean, and 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 where were you when you graduated high school? So I was born in New York City. I was uh, raised, um, finished school in upstate New York in a little little town called Livingston Manor up there in uh, Livingston Manor. Where's the closest bigger city? And that's West New York. West. Yeah, I would say it's near Catskill. So we're up near the Catskill. So the closest city okay. I would say would be Middletown. Okay. It's not a really big city, but Middletown is kind yeah. of the, the stepping stone for us to get into Manhattan and to the other boroughs and stuff. Oh, so, but the Catskills yeah, is good. We, I grew up in New York too. So I, I have not heard of that, your little town. But but uh, I went to school in up, upstate New York, man, like SUNY Potsdam, like above Syracuse, above all, like. So I kind of know the top half of New York. I don't know that Westchester sort of, I, I don't know that area of New York and forget about West. Like nobody realizes how big that state is. Oh, that's cool. So you lived, so you lived like, I don't know, what is that? Like an hour and a half or something outside of Manhattan? 109 miles. So 
I see that sign every day walking to school. <laughs> like, how, how long before I can make this trip out of here? <laughs> Dude, that's hilarious that you have that in your head. Because every day you just looked at that 109 miles and I'm free. You know what's weird about that? I was in, um, I was in Bel Belarus, Minsk. I was in Minsk. And I saw a road sign that said like 700 kilometers to um, to um, Moscow. And my brain just sort of exploded when I saw that sign. You know, I was just yeah. like, that just yeah. reminded yeah. me that same. I'll never forget that sign ever in my life. So, so 109, that's got to be a number that has got to come back in your life at some point. <laughs> That's it, man. You know, it's funny is like I couldn't wait to get out of the little small town and the big city so close to you. And and now when I get the top opportunity to go home back to New York, I can't get enough time there where it's quiet, you know, fishing. You got the same country people that are just nice to each other. So you still your family is still there. Like you set up house still in that little town. No. no, no, just friends from graduation. I mean, my graduating class was, I think, 34. 34. So, I mean, we're all pretty close. So, uh, I get out there when I can. Wow. See, I got one person from high school I still talk to, and you've got, you got like a band of brothers still up there. Well, I got a, I got a few, but they all stayed pretty close. And I'm the guy that's, you know, running around the world, like, where's Rob, you know, kind of thing. But I, I stay close and we have a, we, we have a, 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 you know, kind of like a, a central person that kind of keeps track of everybody and lets us all know what's going on with the people. But I'm probably the most detached just because of the stuff I got going on. Uh, my career path is different than, than a lot of them. That's cool. So so then let's talk a little bit about high school in upstate New York. So what were your interests back then, man? I, I, I'm guessing s sports, just from talking to you, you must have been playing some football up there somewhere. Yeah, everything was, yeah, you know, in uh, those little towns, you play every sport, right? Because they don't have enough people. To, to, <laughs> so you play sports you didn't want to play. So, yeah, I remember having to do track and, uh, you know, just to, to kill time so the other other uh, athletes could, you know, get a rest. But, yeah, so you play all the sports. You know, everybody's close. You know, you have the little bus trips, and, you know, th those are my fondest memories. But, yeah, it was uh, football, baseball, basketball. We didn't have soccer at that time. Only the girls played soccer. But, you know, we had track, cross country when that was a thing. And um, mostly that was that was it. You know, it was quiet, quiet little town, and, and your rivalries were right down the street. And uh, you hated them, and, you know, until you graduated, then we're all friends again. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So it was, uh, it was nice. Yeah, man. And, and no cow tipping back there, right? That's the Long Islander joke was like, like all the hicks upstate yeah. just tipping cows every yeah. weekend. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we get the New Yorkers that come up, you know, for hunting and stuff and they try to tip them. But, you know, cows are pretty hard to tip. <laughs> I don't care how Ooh. fast you are or how strong you are. Oh I've never God, seen one happen dude. before. No, but man. We, uh, I didn't yeah. realize how big they were. Oh, my God, dude. They're. They're brick walls. That's, that's scary. <laughs> so, so academically, what was high school like for you? Was it easy? Was it hard? You didn't really care. You like talk a little bit about that. Academically, um, I wouldn't say it was hard. I had enough credits to graduate when I was a junior because my mom was a tyrant, so I never had a study hall. So. In New York, you had to accumulate, you know, we have a regents, uh, I'm familiar with that back then, we had the regents diplomas, they had your diploma, and they had your regents for, you know, so I had a regents diploma, and uh, my senior year, I only had to go to school for, um, for gym, because that was a requirement, no matter if you had enough credits or not, so I went to school for gym, and that was like, that was just horrible, I mean, I had a year, I went and worked at the hotel, and, you know, some odd jobs, because you weren't allowed to just sit at home, so got a job, a car, but school, I, I don't say it was easy, but um, I guess it was easy. I mean, I never had to, I never struggled with it, but it didn't feel easy. Yeah, dude, I don't know. I don't know how you finished your junior year because I, I remember that every year was a different science subject you had to complete. And I, mean, I don't know how you did that. I, I think I just barely passed the Regents diploma. I, my history exam was so bad and my teacher liked me. 
he was just pick he was finding points just to get me to a 65 on that three exam. Oh man, yeah. Well, uh, like I said, I had I had no uh study halls. I had no uh electives. Um you know, my mom pretty much picked all my classes. I mean, we had to go home and show and and then if you had like a built in a study hall or, or, you know, two study halls you get now, you know, for stuff that that was not time for studying, studying was for home. And when you're in school, you're learning. And she always had me in some crazy earth sciences or something crazy. I mean, yeah, I did. Uh, I did ceramic. <laughs> right, right. Do you have siblings? And what was your mom doing at that time? Was she at home? Was she also working? She was working. So we're a single mom. I have three brothers. One of them was just with me here. He runs a company called um, Lavender Boys, a big cannabis company out of California. And then I have an older brother up in Washington. And then one that, you know, we kind of uh, tricked him to come visit us in Puerto Rico and left him there. He's one of those. But I uh, love him to death. But uh, an island is where he belongs. So, so uh, yeah, she just worked and kind of took care Dude, of us. She's you know, tough. We did the... Uh, she tough was, woman. she was, you know. Tough because I had two, I had two boys and they, I mean, I have five kids with my first wife. Okay. The girls were easy. The bo two boys were tough. I can't imagine three of them by myself. Oh my God. My, and she's a little, wow. little tiny thing, like, like four, 10, four, 11, but she looked like a giant to us. And she, <laughs> if we, even in high school, she still chases around with something to get us. But, you know. And how many times do you get but hit yeah, with a chancleta, she, right? <laughs> Buddy, let me tell you, I still wake up with nightmares. <laughs> I walk into someone's house, I see a big wooden spoon. You know, I got to eat outside. I don't know. <laughs> so. I believe her, man. That, that was the time when you got your, 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 your mom, my mom too, Italian. I mean, like that was. There was no, t it was one word and then you were getting hit. That was it. But look how he turned out, man. Right. That's what my mom said. And I says, well, you turned out okay, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was hard, but you know, she made it easy. I think it prepared for everything. And uh, yeah, I, I'd have to say things were, uh, I don't have a very high um, stress problem. I have a very high stress tolerance. And I think it's from dealing with that hard love for so long, but it was, it was definitely a lot of love, but it wasn't a lot of hugs. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I, I just that generation, man, that generation of moms it was unbelievable. All right. So what were you thinking now as you're a senior, right? It's time to, you, I guess you're thinking I can finally get out of this little town, but what were your thoughts in your senior year about what you were going to do next? Well, senior year was kind of tough. Like I said, I had to, uh, there was nothing going on. I had to kind of work, which I didn't mind working, but it's just, what am I going to do? I had to wait a whole year before I could apply to even go to, to, to go to a school. And then I had the good grades to go and I got accepted to some upstate school and didn't have the money for it. You know, it was going to be a financial burden. I got a half scholarship approved and then the rest is going to be on my, my mom to do. And I just couldn't do that. And I decided to go and join the Air Force. So I said, okay, this sounds like a pretty good thing. The recruiters come in, they want to talk to everybody. I had good scores and I said, all right, this sounds like an okay thing to do. You know, they get you, you only have to do two years or four years. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> you never know what's doing four years. Yeah. We'll get you a college education after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, with the GI bill and all the other stuff they give you in the medical. And I mean, that was to me, that was an easy life. I mean, I can't believe 20 years went through that fast, but for me, it was an easy life. I mean, it was just, just do what you're told, which I had to do my whole life anyway. So it was just, you know, trying to fit in and, you know, and getting along and, and trying to improve things. And, you know, I never had any issues with that. I changed uh, career jobs you know a couple of times so i was lucky enough to be able to do that because of scoring i got my education in there yeah dude you must have scored the recruiter must have freaked out when you took that test because i took that test and i mean it wasn't that difficult and i think i scored super high and they were they were like freaking out and then i i i failed the physical i was a section 4f 
And you should have seen the recruiter's face, man. They just were, they were just devastated. Like, I don't know if there's like, <laughs> they're going to put you anywhere. Scale. <laughs> yeah, that guy wanted to get paid, right? <laughs> um, you must have done really well with that um, test. I did well. I had, I went open, so I could have chosen a lot of different career fields, and the recruiters were pushing heavy. If anybody understands how the recruiting work, doesn't really care what you're good at. They're going to shove you where they need you, and it's up to you to say, ah, I don't think I want that. So, I mean, the first place they put me was in this. Which is so hard to do, by the way. It, these guys are so good at just um, not even asking you questions. They're just telling you. They're so manipulative. It's hard. Especially when you're like 18, forget it. You're 18 years old, and they look like they're towering over you. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. You're 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 running around saluting everything, right? Furniture and everything. But uh, yeah, they talked me into becoming a security specialist, and I thought that was the coolest job in the world. And then now um, I hate that word security because it's it's too vague. So what specific security specialist were you? That was what was funny about it, right? So I, they, you know, said, I'm um, the type of guy you'd be guarding people. You're going to these places. They show you this nice film. And then when you get to your first training base, and they show you this is what you're guarding. It's a building, an empty airplane, a foot locker. You know, it's like you are like the dumbest guy on the base, right? Holding a rifle standing next to an empty building. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, you know? So I went over there and talked to them and said, look, there's no way I'm going to do this. And No, you'll lose your mind. No, no, no. I didn't even, I didn't, I wouldn't even pass the shooting test. I wouldn't try to, to shoot. I, it wasn't going to happen. So they had to make a decision whether they're going to let me retrain into something or to train to something else or let me get out. And I just left it up to them because I just went to school at that point. And they, they were never going to let me go. They had so I, I mean, my scores were high enough. They could put me anywhere. So then they gave me a, a real list of jobs. And I, I wound up going into like logistics field. That was kind of interesting for me. Contracting, supply, the whole logistics world. And that was interesting to me. And that's, I have a buddy who works at a Southern Command down here uh, in South Florida. And that's what he does as a civilian now, the, the logistics. And I'll sit and talk to him sometimes. And it's like also mind blown. We got a problem in Haiti. We got to get a billion of these things there and a hundred thousand of those things there. And I'm like, dude, whatever. It's all good, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, I got some good stories about world. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for, I don't know. First uh, 10 years is just about learning all the supply chain stuff. And then the last 10 years I was a contracting officer. So I was one of those guys that I didn't have to wear a uniform, but go into these hot spots and set up a military installation. I was there in Cyprus for the war, uh, you know, the Iraq war. I was in uh, Italy for that. Um, yeah, so moving around, I was in Kosovo. You know, when we, uh, the uh, U.S. accidentally blew up the Chinese embassy and, and China had to leave. Uh, and then the, and then the, uh, the uh, then, you know, America came in with NATO to, to, you know, to fix, you know, Bosnia and stuff. So I was there for that. And yeah, yeah, it's always fun. Shot at several times, you know, traveling and, you know, doing business and spilling gear and, uh, until they find you. So I'm feeling more comfortable now with this company, these companies you're trying to start, because as I started saying that they are a logistical nightmare, like you have that high that I don't want to say high end. You've got that really complicated logistics background, like the scale of what you have to do, what you had to do. This is, um, I feel like it's at the same scale. Maybe you think it's easier because you don't have a bureaucracy or something in front of you, but I feel like it's the same scale that you had to deal with and you have the experience. I think so. When I went to, um, when I went to Cyprus for the deployment of that, so we, we went to Cyprus, that was all, hush hush stuff um but you know eventually everybody knew the military was there. i went in there i was the only uh american there military and a commander that came in and we had to spin that thing up with like four thousand soldiers and like 200 and something airplanes expand the runway i had to find housing food logistics uh every everything you can think of where they're going to wash their clothes same thing i did in, in kosovo 
So when, by the time I left there, we were actually running our missions out of that place, and it was just a full-blown UN base that was just pounding. Um, if anybody looks up what you know Cyprus was, yeah, yeah. So that was huge, and you're talking about thousands of people that come in that don't even have a place to eat. You got to get a place to eat, place to sleep, place to do their laundry. I mean, every little thing you can think of what you would need to go to a foreign country. So I'm the first guy on the ground. I go in there and then with a big suitcase of money and a finance officer, and we just put it to work. And we get everybody, and they come in, and bam, the, the planes start landing, and then they go to work. You have a translator too, right? I mean, you're not speaking all these languages. No, you have a translator. Um, I have a security guy when I go, but having the translator and security guy makes you less safe, unfortunately. So, you know, you, you travel around. I, I always like going by myself. If I had to pay bills, I would take my finance officer with me. Otherwise, I, I'm, I feel safer alone. I got my nine mil. And uh, you just try not to get yourself in any bad situations. And I'm out there negotiating deals on behalf of the government. And, uh, you know, you're just careful where you do it, you know, and who you talk to. Yeah. And they have advanced teams that come in that'll say this is friendly to U.S. and this is not and stay away from this area and that area. And you just, you know, do that. And, you know, the security guys, they can't they're not allowed off base. So anytime you ask for a security detail, you know, there's a thousand hands that go up, you know. <laughs> this is a chance to get McDonald's. They're up, you know. <laughs> yeah, just to get out of the base. So, yeah, that was good times. Those are some good times. Yeah. I just other thoughts that pop in my head. You know, I I travel. I've traveled, not like anything you have, but all over the world for the most part. You know, and you, you learn as you're doing that. But one thing I learned was, I was in our, in our Orlando airport one day. The flight was delayed. Everybody was losing their mind. And I just looked at everybody. I said, you're in the U.S., your cell phone works, and you have money. What are you panicking about, right? <laughs> like, let's do that overseas with no money, your phones are not working, and you can't talk to half the people that are around. That's stress. Like, everybody's got to relax, right? And you must have that same attitude sometimes when you've seen people lose their minds for the most basic little things, right? Yes, you know, uh, sometimes I catch myself, I'll have someone fly in to see me and stuff like that. And I'll say, okay, this is where we're staying. And for me, that was always enough information. I'll find my way to get there. Other people need to be picked up. Who's coming to get me? Where do I go? What gate? I'm like, dude, are you serious? Follow the signs to the train, the bus or the taxi and give them this address. And it's all good. You know, just uh, ring me when you get to the hotel. But no. It's, it's complicated for a lot of people, they, you know, and, and Americans especially because they don't leave to a lot of places. And when they do go to places, it's usually in a group on a tour or something like that. So even then they don't get to experience the culture of trying to figure stuff out. Where am I going? How am I going to get there? So, um, yeah, I've been fortunate enough to be able to go to all these places. And to me, it's just I get there and I don't really it's not even second thought. I blend in as fast as I can. And I just get to doing what I need to do and, and, you know, make some good contacts that way. And I think when you get into the culture a little bit, and of course, we always are, are weary of people, what their intentions are, but you find some really good people. You really can enjoy the culture and you, and you can figure out, you know, who's good and where to go and, and stuff like that. It, uh, travel more like a, a local than a tourist. My wife and friends sometimes they'll be like, aren't you like... As simple as even just London, which is super easy, right? But like, aren't you going to London tomorrow? Yeah. Where are you staying? I don't know. I haven't looked at that. I don't know. But they're asking me all these questions. They're like, I don't know. They're like, when are you going to know? When I get when the plane lands, I'll look it. Up. I'll look it up. I don't know. Like, I'm not stressed out about any of it. I know I have the information somewhere, right? And they look at me like I got two heads. <laughs> yeah. They want, they like to mapped out. They don't like that uncertainty of stuff. You know, uh, how, where am I going to get money? You know, like only America has ATMs, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, there's money everywhere, you know, bring some with you and, and the rest, you just get out the ATM. But yeah, that's, that's kind of what it's been like. I just been running around the world for, it feels like for 20 years more. Yeah. Just running around. It's just normal. Yeah. But traveling with the military is, a lot different than traveling as a civilian on these commercial airlines, right? 
Well, most of flight, yeah. So in some of the bases, you have to you have to go in on a military base because you don't come in with your visa or your passport, right? That stuff is all taken from you before you get on because they don't want you know anybody to know who you are. But um, a lot of a lot of military flights I do is commercial. The difference is that you're always going alone, so it's a little scary sometimes. You're going into a hot zone. Like when I went to Kosovo, we just literally you know, weeks after blowing up the embassy over there, right? And, uh, you know, Kosovo was being ethnically cleansed and, you know, Milosevic and the, those guys were fighting the Serbs and the Croats. I mean, everybody was at war there. They had all these uh, these areas that were, you know, littered with bombs. They had people patrolling. You don't know who was friendly, who was not friendly. I was on Camp Abel Sentry there. And I had a truck and that was all. I had a truck and I had a, a an, an M16, which I had to carry. And my nine mil, and, and it was a Nissan because I couldn't go in a military vehicle or else I would get attacked. So I'd go up there, and and it was just, um, yeah, it was, that was the only time I think I was ever felt, you know, getting chased around and shot at and is never fun. But you see mass graves, you see these people trying to get out of these countries. It's just, it's just horrible. That was the only time I ever went to kind of a hot zone, and that was just a horrible, horrible situation. But yeah, you know, I. It was a. It was still a very good mission. It was probably my favorite mission, even better than Cyprus. But uh, best time you ever want to uh, have it again. It was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the best time I'd ever want to have again. That's exactly it. <laughs> but providing those people like simple things like food and where they could shower, the appreciation you got from just that alone, you know. And then the army. I deployed that time with the army, not with the air force. So I came as an air force guy, and everybody knows the air force has all the money. So I came in and, uh, you know, they're so happy to see me. And we started, you know, spending money on their on their living quarters because they all live in these temper tents, like 10, 15 to a tent. Air Force lives two to a Connex box with AC, TV, refrigerator. That's the minimum standard for Air Force deploying. So you can imagine how angry the uh, Army was. Plus, we had, you know, the cable news and like nine channels. I brought all that in and then I dispersed it to everybody and i wound up getting you know, a lot of conics boxes for people to be able to sleep two to a room and built that whole base up because it was going to be long term so but that was the scary one but also the most rewarding one all right so you do 20 years it was supposed to be um four years and then you were going to go to university 20 years later you decide that you've done everything that you're going to do or is it is it i I could be totally wrong here, but is it that at some point you reach a certain rank and you realize that you don't want the next rank or the next rank is just going to be too hard to achieve and then you decide to go? At a certain rank, it becomes political. You have to start checking all these boxes. You become fake. You don't really, it's not about the mission or about your accomplishments. It's about you wanting to get to that next level and God bless those guys. You know, we need them but they want to be there. And if you don't want to be the guy that's doing all these crazy functions just to get your name out and doing all these boards and things like that, taking assignments that you wouldn't want in a million years, just so you can say, I did that or else you're not competitive. Then it just gets to the point where, okay, I'm going to hit, you know, master sergeant, I'm going to hit this certain rank. And then that's enough for me because that last two ranks are just, you know, unachievable and still enjoy your life now the guys who strive for that that is like the ultimate goal and the ultimate reward i feel bad because such a low percentage of those people make it after putting all that time in but you know who those people are <laughs> you know you know who those people are so god bless them you keep all the attention just send me over to you know wherever i'll go back to cyprus or i'll go to ramstein air base I, you know i was in aviano for a while I went over there. We we're doing deployments from there for the first Gulf. So, you know, you send me to Italy. I, I'm, I'm good. You stay here and, you know, you, you, you pound it out like a trooper and get that rank, man. God bless you. So, yeah, so I did that. And then at that point, I had all of this knowledge about contracting, how to get in. And then uh, you have all of these companies that have these brilliant, brilliant ideas, technology. They're never going to get into the government because there's a way to get in. As a contracting officer, I was one of the people that had to select those companies. And there's a process you go through. So I got out. I figured I would start a company helping these guys get in. And that's what I did. I started a thing. I hooked up with one company. I've been 
probably the leading in the world in robotics, unmanned ground robotics, uh, not even probably, hands down, the leading is called a company called Macro Swiss, uh, Switzerland, owned by a guy named Robin Castelli. So he, uh, another New York guy. So he, um, Italian back and forth, but he, what, what year this is has this? to be in, um, let me see, I wrote the contracts in Singapore for, let me see, that was in 2009. So around 2000. Seven, I would say, is when I got out. Two thousand seven. Okay. okay, two thousand seven. Somewhere around okay, there. Cool. Yeah. So, so then I started a company called Force Products Group, and my goal was just to take all of these emerging technologies and get them contracts and how to navigate through the government system and and stuff like that. And they were the first ones we took on. We had some other people trying to get some nice things, but these guys had the best technology in the world, couldn't get in. So I got them. Uh, you know, I signed. Uh, they signed up with me, and we. I got them a contract. With- What's the revenue model on that? You get a percent of their first contract? Yeah, so we would we would do a cost plus type of thing. So it was like a rev share. Everything I do now is like rev share. So we do a cost plus. So we would say um, the robot costs X, and then you know I know what the military would bear if it's a type of a cost plus contract or technology contract, stuff like that. So I would go after the contracts that had, you know, R&D and, you know, uh, being minority veteran owned, we would get the development costs. So we'd be get to build stuff specific for the government using their background technology, the intellectual property. So I got them that first contract. So I said, OK, we're going to do this. We're going to develop this robot. And the government was looking for some unmanned sp- spy robots and um you know we said okay we'll we'll do this one so we got a contract to develop this whole robot out and what happened was funny enough you know um i'm the one who wrote the contract for me and macro swiss because i'm the contracting officer so we went through the whole thing and they signed it i don't know four five six months later macro swiss was defaulting on the timelines i had to fly out to italy to meet mr castelli and Turns out there was an investor in the background and he was not putting money in. I already given Castelli a million dollars and they weren't uh, putting the money in. Um, and um, they defaulted. I gave him a show cause notice. I said, hey, you know, cure notice. You got to fix this. We got to get back on time. I got to explain this to government. We've already fronted, I believe it was a million or just over a million for the research. Uh, they had two subcontractors in Chile, a company called Technocal and Mechanical Studios, which my engineer from Mechanical Studios, he's still with me. 13 years later, I stole him from Chile. But uh, he was the one doing the lighting when, when we came on. So, yeah, so he, um, you know, they defaulted and I came out and I issued them a termination notice. And at that point, they lost all their intellectual property. So I personally owned all their 12 years of background technology. So we changed the name from Macro Swiss to Macro USA. And from there, we were a USA company with 11 years of technology. Robin became my C, uh, CTO, so he stayed with us. And from there, we went on and supplying this technology all over the world. We got still now Singapore, Hong Kong, we got the US, we developed stuff. The smartest robot system in the world, the Idris platform out of the U.S., we developed that system. And um... All right, hold on, hold on. i got to interrupt you for a second. All right, all right. First of all, I thought the story was going to go down as these guys destroyed my reputation because my first contract, <laughs> I promised something and it didn't deliver. So that took a turn. <laughs> they, but, you know, they did acquiring me a favor. tech is, well, it, it sounds like it, but what's mind-blowing to me is it's one thing to acquire tech, but tech is no good without the people that were behind it, right? Correct. So all, Correct. From my so here's what my brain is thinking. Great, they defaulted. I'm going to acquire, but I've got a payroll now in front of me that I got to deal with. Can't let all these people go. So what are the logistics on paying people when you acquire uh, a decade plus of tech? And you're a logistics guy, so I know you're going to figure it out, but. <laughs> oh, yeah. Figure it out real quick, right? So we, when I did the contract with the U.S. government, I had a, a cost plus. So as long as I can justify the cost and I can justify the delays and things like that, 
I already mitigated all my risks. My downside was already mitigated. I never had a concern about that. Oh, my only concern was not performing and not being able to explain why I can't perform. But I was never worried about that because the technology was already proven. We've already done it. So what I did in that situation was I terminated. Now they had to, they went up for liquidity or, or whatever. They have to sell all their stuff. We bought all that stuff. I mean, what is else anybody else can do it? So we just bought it all, shipped it all to U.S., opened up a factory on McClellan Air Force Base, which was just converted from an active uh, uh, logistics depot for the Air Force. Now we have all these buildings that are empty. They were, you know, pretty much giving free space, just come on there. Then I flew into Chile, and that's where I met Ricardo Michaela. He's the guy who's with me now to set up my lighting. And I met uh, the owner of TechnoCal, doing the electronics engineering and the mechanical engineering. And I said, let's talk. What's going on? Well, macro, macro, uh, I'm sorry, not macro Swiss. Uh, macro Swiss has not paid us. And this is where we're at. And this is what we need to finish. And I went over to Mechanical Studios. M Mr. Michaela took me out to dinner. I said, what's going on? This, that, 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 that. No one's getting paid. So I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. You guys are all going to pack your shit. And we're going to move to California. So I got them all. I got them all into California on a temporary work permit, right? We're building a, the Department of Only Defense robot system. Off, <laughs> Bro, they, I put all these guys in one house, and we and I had my my technology guy come in, and you know, and we um we built that damn robot, and we delivered it, and we got an order for five, we got an order for a five million dollar order for for the government, best robot ever. You know, we had we were competing against. Uh, iRobot, who's been here forever. We're competing against Kinetic forever. And this is where the story goes kind of south, you know, unfortunately. But our robot was the best robot in the world, for sure. N not even not even close. The stuff we could do with our robot, nobody else could do. So, um, yeah, so we finished that contract up. We did that. And then, um, you know, the government still tried to issue contracts to iRobot because, the, I mean, they're a very strong political party. Now they're out of the game iRobot at one time tried to buy us. Their president was in my office trying to do some stuff. Turns out he's trying to figure out how long we could last if they kept protesting. <laughs> he's just wondering how much money we had. And then, uh, you know, Kinetic, uh, you know, they're a very good company as well. They just had a lot bigger robot. And the requirements was like a five-pound robot. It had to have a range of 100 meters non-line of sight and all these different things for targeting, for, you know, we had the software that we work with other companies for facial recognition, for room mapping, things like that. So we, they didn't have that package size and they didn't have an arm. So our robot could pick things up and, you know, so we could do a lot of different things, which is really cool. But we were never going to win that contract, even though the reports came back, said this is the only robot that works because we were using a, a new technology, the politics. We were using new technology. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't new, but it's co-FDM technology. It works off reflection. And uh, this is all stuff I had learned because I didn't know shit about robotics back then. But basically. Dude, this is 2007, 2008. I mean, this was still new tech at that time. This wasn't perfected tech. Yes, it was still new. This the only people. The only people who had this technology was uh, like the people who did like the Olympics you know, big vans where they can do the high def. And we had to take one of those van size uh, transmitters and get it to about this big, you know, about the size of your thumb, the top of your thumb. And it was like impossible. We got a company out of Pennsylvania, flew them into uh, Singapore and said, hey, can you help us to, you know, build this? And everybody thought we were nuts. But, you know, shit, a year later, we had the smallest co FDM transmitter. We go 300 yards. We went back to New York and worked with Taru they were transmitting from a 21st or 22nd story building, transmitting to the van in the street, the control unit in the street, and it was transmitting back to the headquarters so everybody could see it and they're controlling the robot up there. No one could believe it. And we still got that. Yeah, so that was, that was nice. But with all that, we still could not get a DOD contract. Other than the five million or the five million worth that we got, after that, they, you know, they couldn't give it to a you know a small little company like us out there in the middle of McClellan Air Base when you got these big companies that have uh, so much power. But the contracts were never issued. And you couldn't think of a commercial. Oh, I mean, I, we protested and we beat the.
out of my, every time they, they they could never issue the contract. It got to the point where they issued me a letter saying, you know, that I'm the cause of all these people's lives and blah 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 because you know I wouldn't let those contracts go through because we had the best robot. I robot robot was put in a, a a storage box down there labeled POS, and out came in the report from the army. And uh, this is who we had to, this is who we had to compete with, but they still were getting a piece of that contract, and it was it was just heartbreaking heartbreaking so yeah we just protest this stuff and uh yeah kinetic you know great company but they didn't have an arm for their robot we had an arm to do things which is a requirement they still won the contract and then we protested because um they won a contract for like five thousand arms but they didn't have a robot to put the arms on so of course i protested the arm contract because it's you know in our terms. I'm a contracting officer, right? So they 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 ran into the wrong guy. Yeah, but now you're be, becoming a pain in the ass to everybody because all you're doing is protesting. Yeah. Correct. But what happens That's to exactly all this right. tech? So what happens to all this tech? It just it gets put on a shelf. Well, not really. We started doing. Uh, we did Hong Kong. We did the Singapore Future Soldier System. So we have all that tech. We built out their system. That was a, a design build with a transfer of technology. So we built it, turned it over to them. We did Hong Kong uh, Special Police. We did some stuff uh, over here in Thailand. We, I think we're in 11 countries, France. Um, so this is what I'm hearing you say. The U.S. government, for whatever reason, didn't want this tech, but you were able to sell it to another 11, 11 different governments that ended up having better tech than the U.S. at some point. <laughs> Correct. And you know what's funny about it is the U.S. won't buy it, but you still have to fill out the paperwork for the State Department to prove who you're going to sell it to. And they say no a lot more than they say yes. Yeah, I'm thinking like it's scary, right, to me that you, you now you can just I mean, I'm you're talking about countries that are all friendlies, but still at the end of the day, countries turn fairly quickly. And now you've got this tech that could be used against you. Yeah, like, you know. They, they might want the transmitter transmission codes and things like that. You know, we had a frequency hopping, so it wouldn't have mattered anyway. But, yeah, they would say no all the time. We try to sell it someplace. They'd say no, 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 no. It's all we got. So it just gets to the point where, you know, if I can't if I can't go this way, you know, we got the story out and, you know, it just turned out to be a, a, a huge mess. I remember I still have the article. They're like, what are you doing to this small company? Why are you doing this? It's just so political. It's hard. I was done with that. That was fun. Yeah, I was done. I was, it was fun. And I was just like, I'm done, you know. So when was all that done? That was like five years of your life trying to build and sell this tech? Yeah, five years, about five. Yeah, so I'd say 2008 to 2014, 15, somewhere in there. Yeah, that's what we were working on. Then after that, she started doing. Five years is like a mental breaking point. It's I don't know why, but. You try your ass off for five years, and then at some point, that's when you're capable of saying, I'm done. Well, the hard part was really, you know, being a contracting guy and understanding how it works. I know what's going on on the inside. I know what they're doing in those meetings. I've been in those meetings. When we want to select one thing over another, you find the way to select it. But I know how to make sure that I'm not in that situation. There's nothing they can say that's going to, to convince me or show me. Did you ever, okay, so just from talking to you for almost an hour, like personality wise, you are a strong guy. You know what has to get done. You can get people to move. You can make things happen. But I feel like maybe you should have hired a, a, a guy that could be more political in those meetings and, and kind of, you know, take him out for that steak dinner. You know what I'm saying? Like my brain is thinking yeah. what you needed is, what you needed is one of those guys you hate, you know, being political for you. Yeah, yeah. We did hire somebody, you know, and he was good enough to go out and get us the reports and stuff through, you know, whatever connections they had. And they were a good company. And, uh, we know, that's how we found out that we were selected by all the downfield commanders, that we're the robot that was wanted. It was the one that was going to save lives. But in the end, you know, the secretary of the army is the one who actually has to say yes. And it's always going to be, it's always going to be that guy he's having dinner with in DC. It's always going to be that guy. Yeah. So you just kind of take it and it's like, okay, this is the way it is. I, there's no way you're going to win this thing. 
you, you make a product that's too good, you know, you're better off just making, you know, widgets that nobody cares about. Did you ever think of just then going to the company that that won the contract and just sell the tech? That way it doesn't disappear. We offered to team up where they could just take our robot under their umbrella. And we did. We teamed up with Vanguard. You know, Vanguard's huge, right? Huge robotics company. Vanguard, I think, gave me like one point two million to to something like some crazy number like that to take over our robots and get them into the military. And then like four months later, they deleted their robot program, never took their order. So I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, that's nice, right? And then we teamed up with um, Northrop Grumman, which was also on McClellan Air Base, not the division that was building the robot, to work to build the robot. We built the Adris robot. If you look up Adris, A-E-O-D-O-R-S, smartest robot in the world, the capabilities of things. So we built this thing. We got the contract to do this thing. We teamed up with other people that put on electronics and then it won, right? So it got funded. They put Northrop Grumman, uh, I think it was Northrop Grumman. I want to say it was Northrop Grumman. I can't remember off the top of my head, but they put them as the prime contract. Obviously we could never be the prime contract because we're a small company. And those guys selected someone else to build our robot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my and God. They, they expected us to turn over the background IP. I was like, you guys are insane. So that's another program. We said, well, then go, go build it yourself. They wanted to know how we got the carbon fiber a certain way. I mean, all that technology goes into this thing. You have these engineers that are killing themselves to develop this technology. And they just say, okay, well, we're going to do that. And we even offered to say, hey, we'll, you know, bring us in and we'll just build the shell or something. But no, they were just adamant. And that had to be coming from someone. Thank God you're a patriot. Thank God you're a patriot. Because I could see somebody else just say, go, go F yourself now and go rogue somewhere and just take everything with them, right? And I'm sure that happens. Well, I, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure people do it. Me, I was just happy to get I mean, it was frustrating because I had an amazing team. And it was frustrating to see how let down they were because this we're like one big contract away from being huge, right? Expanding and eh, it just uh, just wasn't meant to be. So we, we left with that. And and then. Um, so so what happens now in 2000? Um, what is it like 13? Right, so you, you decide, OK, this is going to work out. So now what? Yeah. So we're, we're still running around doing sales for certain things and and still doing small contracts around uh, for the robots with other countries. So now we're, we've just completely just gotten off the U.S. That program, both those programs died. You know, we kind of killed both those programs, and the U.S. kind of moved. iRobot got out of the uh, military side of things. I don't know if Kinetic's still in there or not. And then we started working globally with other people doing, doing different types of, of projects with the technology. We got into some stuff in Malaysia where they wanted to use the robots for um, – inspecting the inside of tunnels uh, for their fuel lines, uh, some for reconnaissance. Uh, Hong Kong was using it to, um, they're having problems in certain areas. Uh, and they would use a robot for kind of, for kind of surveillance. Uh, in Thailand, the South of Thailand, having some problems with some kind of insurgency stuff and attacks on police. And they would preposition these things where they could drive around and do stuff. So just little st stuff like that. I'm already retired. Just just kind of enjoying doing little things like that, you know. Yeah, little from things there, like just, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> little, little things, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are the good old days. But but it was hard also because uh, the technology, you know, it's one of those things that never ends. You know, you're always, you're always trying to stay ahead of your competition. And uh, engineers, I don't know if you ever worked with engineers, they're like a bunch of prima donnas, you know. God bless them. I love them. But their product is never good enough to go to market ever. So it's almost like pulling teeth to take it. It's like you're trying to take their child from them so you can make some money, turn into revenue. There's always something that 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 can be done. And then you always have new technology climbing up on you, coming from behind and stuff like that. So getting out when we did, you know, we made our mark. We got the technology out there. We have the, co the smallest co-FDM radios in the world. Uh, what they're being used for now, I'm sure if I did some research, they're probably in everything now. Um, great transmitters, work off reflection, can can go through buildings and, and stuff. Like I said, you know, you could be on the first floor and, and the robot in a metal elevator up on the eighth floor. And you could still see it and control it. And this technology was important. Like 
when you see what's coming out of Boston Dynamics today, that's got to freak you out since you were you're kind of in this space. Bro, the robots are doing flips. They're squatting. They're they're on uneven terrain, moving. We had a hard time with that with uh, our robot with wheels. So we had to develop tracks just to get over that uneven terrain. These guys are now walking on that stuff. The amazing things these guys are doing. This is, like you said, this is what over the last you know ten years. I remember them just having you know very little capability uh, when we were doing the unmanned system, which was a lot easier. Um, but these guys now, I mean, these it's scary what they're what they're accomplishing. Yeah. So take that mobile robot with all the other tech you're talking about and package it all together. I see that. I, I mean, it's ter that's Terminator level stuff now. Talk about <laughs> a weapon system, right? That can do a lot of a lot of bad things to somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're getting you know smarter. What so. you know, it's, what, it's like I, I never got into the army, but I, and you don't have to answer this question, but I always believe that the tech at the say army level is about ten years ahead of what we see consumer wise. And I kind of have that impression because of CDs, like government, the armies, our military was using CD technology before we ever had it to kind of play music. And that was mind blowing to me, right? Because the tech at the consumer level already today is pretty wild. I can't imagine already 10 years from now, but it already exists, right? So I, my brain then looks at Boston Dynamics and thinks, where are they going to be in 10 years? And I go, idiot, they're already 10 years ahead of what you're, what they're sharing. Right, right, right. And Boston Dynamics is, you know, a very good recipient of a lot of defense funding, you know, DARPA and those programs. We got money from those types of programs when you develop like different platforms. And the, the government is very good at kind of seeking out some of this uh, technology and it really advancing it. Uh, I think the problem with the government is that some of the smartest people in the world don't want to be part of some huge corporation or team. They're happy developing this technology in their garage, you know, by themselves or with someone else. And a lot of that technology never makes it out. But the government does a pretty good job of spreading out that money and getting that, the best technology where it needs to be, you know. And they do it also through uh, teaming arrangements like what they did with us and, um, you know, having our platform go with another company so we can actually bid on a project together. You know, they force you into that big company, but it's always a big company that gets the contract because they are financially stable. So you have to understand that as well. You just can't throw, you know, a million dollars or something in their garage and hope that it works. So, um, yeah. And the other thing is that a lot of these things, they come with like requirements to get the uh, background IP or the foreground IP of what's going to be developed using the background IP. And the government always wants to own that for military applications. And then you negotiate how much of that you get to own for commercial applications. So if you're not careful, then, you know, you wind up owning none of your own stuff, but you made a lot of money. So it just depends on how, how they go. But yeah, yeah, you're right. They're so far ahead because they're sprinkling money at a lot of people who are very close to doing some pretty amazing things. And those people are the, you, you know, you won't hear about them 10 years, you know, you'll know about them. I'd like to get some of those tips about where that money's going, right? That you put some money on some stocks. <laughs> then the black seeds show up. I have a little company and I have the same problem. We just landed probably our largest corporation in 10 years. And it's funny because every time we, we land a bigger company, they want us to have more insurance. This time they asked us for a level of insurance and we looked at them and we said, we're not big enough to buy that. Like they won't even sell it to us. Like, what are we right, supposed to do right, here? Right. And then that's scary because now it's like, are they going to do business with a company? Luckily, we're in enough of a niche where they agreed to do it. But you need that sort of, you need to be around for 10 years and you need to get lucky where you have enough of a niche. The company's willing to work with you, even if you're, even if you're small. It's been a challenge. So I, I hear what you're saying there. Or the money goes to your competitor just over something simple like that, even though you're providing a nice niche uh, product, a nice niche service. And you have the better service, a better product, but it goes to them because they have a bigger bank account and they have someone else bigger behind them. It's like, oh, you see enough of those go past you. It's like, damn, yeah, you know, I got kids that got it. How are you supposed to get that big if you don't give me the contract? <laughs> right, 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 right. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. crazy. So, look, I want to, 
What happens after all that? How do you get into the food industry? I'm I'm trying to find this transition now. So when is it that you wake up one morning and you say, what year is it? You're like, well, I'm I'm going to deal with food. I guess it's COVID time. So it's in because we're in. OK, we're in like 2013. Right. You did your five years there, but there's at least another five years before we get to COVID. So you're just still trying to. I went. So I went home. Uh, I I separated my shoulder. I was home. I couldn't do some you know work and stuff. I had a buddy call me on uh, um, energy company, you know, trading commodity, you know, energy and things like that and asked me. I didn't know anything about energy, but, uh, you know, as a contracting officer, help them structure the stuff. So I teamed up with a company called Falcon Royce and, you know, we have an OPEC number. So it gave me the ability to source and to fill requirements. And I was always about structured finance. So I liked what they were doing. It gave me the ability to, um, when I say structured finance, we could take our OPEC oil, move it into a country that doesn't have money. They fund it. OPEC uh, equity could fund that, that uh, oil. Then we take the, we crack it sell the oil from the refinery of that country so let's just say ghana you know um team oil refinery the oil can go in there the government cracks it because they pretty much governments own all these things the, we sell the offtake the money from the offtake goes back into you know doing infrastructure contracts and things like that so we were doing things like that so if you looked up like r2 global energy my company out of singapore we were part of the thailand 4.0 which was the future sold uh future um city uh, that they were building out here before COVID started. And that was all through structured finance using, you know, oil and commodities as leverage to fund these things. So this is kind of what I did for about four or five years, trying to get into places without the governments having to pay for the, for the stuff. If they had a refinery and they had the capacity to take on, let's say a million barrels, you put the oil in, you sell the uh, locally or internationally, and that's all done through the bank, the bank of record and the account of record. And then the revenue comes back to to um, uh, create the the infrastructure, whatever you're building, say bridges, trains, whatever they wanted. Um, so in the way we worked it out. I got I, I got I to interrupt you here because this scare this. This is the stuff that scares me. Are you you're moving oil around the planet at the end of the day, right? Like, are you registered with the U.S. government as somebody who's moving international oil around the planet? Because I would imagine that that would show up as some warning signs of of nefarious uh, activities from a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Well, no. So it's not it's not like illegal oil. So I was more part of the structured finance to contracting side for what we do with the money after it's cracked. The oil transactions happen through like Falcon Royce, which is a merchant bank of record and OPEC equity, which they have the OPEC license to sell. So you have a government. So it's basically, I don't say government to government, but it's government to OPEC. That's it because it's OPEC equity is funding the infrastructure. So, I mean, if you look at like the bank, the equity part of it, they, they front the oil, the oil gets cracked, it gets sold. And then the infrastructure gets built using the credit facility from the equity part. And then, They've made you, it's going to take you, what, 12, 15 years to pay on some of these infrastructure projects. They made you a consumer of the product as well as a, you know, a financial partner. That's the way it works. And then we worked our way in. So when I put the contracts in, I would select people who would give us like an equity position. Like I would want like a 30-year concession if we're building a, a water filtration system or if you're building a waste energy system, things like that, then you would try to negotiate, you know, um, an equity position or not just a commission you know i wasn't uh, a trader trying to make 10 cents 20 cents a barrel we were trying to actually do some good things that's what we were trying to do and that's just kind of transferred to the way we're doing what we're doing today but that's how we got the stuff moved around things got a little more complicated with the you know inception of esg and all this stuff now when we do uh a transaction then you had to have some carbon offsets you had to have some clean energy offsetting the you know dirty energy you're creating and it made things a little more complicated but at the same time it was it was a welcome thing as long as the you, you could fund like the green energy part of it with the uh with the um the money you're making off of the oil or whatever you're cracking and then of course you had issues with uh 
the banks would no longer finance brown uh, green fields, which no new construction always had to be something that was already there. So it just got to be just too much regulation, too much ESG. And and then the owner of um, Fallenbrook passed away. And then I was like, all right, let me just take a break. You know, it just it wasn't it's just a headache when you deal with governments, uh, the U.S. included the corruption at that level is there. I don't care what government you are. It's just hidden. But are you living you're living in Singapore at this point? Is that kind of where you're living when you're doing all this work? No. So, no. Uh, Thailand for the last three years before that, I was doing it all out of the U.S. And then I would travel to Singapore, uh, you know, to do meetings and to Thailand. I love Singapore. I, I'm going in November. So do I. I'm, I'm going in November again. I, I'd love to spend a month there. Singapore is amazing. Yes. Best kept secret in the world. You know, you wonder who works there, right? I don't care what day it is. The malls are full every day. Yeah, it's crazy. Cleanest city out here. I've never been to a cleaner city. So cleanest city. Most beautiful trip from the airport to the city is Singapore. Most beautiful. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to getting back over there. Nice. Nice. So, yeah. So that's what I did for a little while. We had the gap there. And then, um, yeah, then COVID hit and everything kind of stopped. And and it was hard to get these contracts uh, for oil. Everything went down. There was nobody using it. Uh, you know what the oil industry went to and the structured finance. And like I said, uh, Mr. Cox, he passed away. And I just took a break. They still hit me up trying to get me to do stuff. Right now they hit me up to do a, a waste energy systems and stuff like that. But, you know, I'll, I'll facilitate something with the Board of Investment here in Thailand. I got to, uh, you know, I work with them here to, you know, to put a couple of companies together. So I'll do stuff like that when I can to help, but it's not what I want to do. It's just, it's not like you want to get out of government work, but even this new stuff with food requires a lot of government, dude, you're, you're, you're dealing with food and you're dealing with the, the, I, you can't get, I don't think you'll ever get away from government work. You just have too many relationships and too much knowledge of the logistics. Well, the way we're trying to build it out is we're trying, you know, all food is local, right? That's what you, we want. We're trying to make it. So we're trying to build it out where we don't have to have any dependence on government funding relationships to be able to do it. So the farmers are required to get their, their a GAP certification to be able to, to farm and to be able to sell. So all we're doing is giving them free access to a global platform. So if they make oranges and they want to sell oranges, everybody in the world can see them. All right, but get, get get back to me. I, I'm going to pull you back here because I want to know when you woke. I want to know about the day you woke up and you said, or you got the phone call or something that said, "All right, this is what I'm going to focus all of my energy on for the next three years." Ah, okay. So, so COVID hits. We're I'm stuck in Thailand. My wife is Thai, and uh, we couldn't go to the U.S. I think till like August. All the planes, everything. Nobody's leaving Thailand. Everybody had to get out by a certain time. She was allowed into the U.S. So, okay, we stayed. So um, we were kind of working on this technology, the traceability for the, the commodities, and that kind of went sideways. Didn't want to do anything with that with, you know, all the problems we're having. So a buddy of mine asked me about cannabis. Thailand was becoming legal in cannabis. The legislation just started and asked me if I would do something in the cannabis industry. And... Uh, so I said I would look into it. I didn't know anything about cannabis, never tried it before. So I uh, started digging into that. And next thing I knew, I was like, okay, yeah, I can do this, but I'll do it a certain way. I wanted to structure it in a way that was what I call generational wealth and decentralized wealth, which means we weren't going to be some top heavy company that's going to be producing all of this stuff. We wanted to make sure that the little guy on a, what they're projecting to be a $2 billion industry was going to be able to make money also off of the cannabis in the country, the locals with the shops. So when I started signing up shops and stuff, we were signing up cafes and hair salons and things like that, not big uh, foreign money coming in. So that's a model that we put together. So one day. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You're signing them up to sell product and you have now product out in the middle of the country. What are you signing them up for to sell product? The the local barber, I can go into the local barber and buy buy a uh, whatever three As grams much, whatever, of yeah three grams. flour. 
the farmers, I mean, everything was just starting. I mean, there was a, an underground market here, so it wasn't legal, but they were growing, you know. So everybody at that point, three years ago, was just trying to position themselves to when it became legal. And then that's what they were having me do. So I was trying to, I could put a company together and I could put a structure together that I think would be sustainable. And this was a model that we were going to go with. So that's what I was doing. But in the, in the course of meeting certain people, I was invited to go to a meeting regarding, it was the uh, um, Global Agriculture Food Security Program. I was like, I don't know what this was, you know, but all right, I'll go talk to you. Well, they were interested in the traceability like for food security, like how can we implement, it? how can we solve this problem? Because what the government does now, every government, they just throw money at it, right? This is in Thailand. We're talking about inside of Thailand. Okay. Inside of Thailand. So the governments normally just throw money at, at the problem. So I sat down with this nice couple and they are just explaining all the stuff they want to do. And so I put the proposal together as a food security proposal for them how it's going to work, how we're going to track it, how we're going to give access, free access, right? So anybody can sign on and see who's selling what and how we're going to do it and say, okay, this is it. And not just that, but also we have to create the smart farming facilities so they can grow, which means we have to bring money in to build them a facility to be able to create the climate conditions to make the perfect whatever, uh, tomatoes or strawberries or Florida oranges, they're grown in a certain type of climate condition and having a smart farming facility with AI built in will help you do that. So once we had all this stuff in there, you can literally make your small community independent of logistical issues moving food globally. So that's what we proposed. So the first step was to build the app and then we started building the farmer registration page and that's as far as right now. We haven't built the other stuff, but one of the things that that it goes for is once a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace is done where we are connecting everybody, all this goes on blockchain. So all the data is immutable and there can't be any fraud. Let's talk about that because uh, I'm a tech guy. I understand blockchain and Web3. And I know you're not a tech guy, so maybe you can't answer some of these questions, which is, which is fine. But are you looking to, you're looking to build your own blockchain or are you looking to put this on Ethereum? No, they're we're looking to build our own blockchain. So originally we we're looking at doing it on Ethereum and then, you know, doing, dealing with the community and the blockchain space, which I'm not very smart in, you know, people said we should have one that's specific for this type of sector that can incorporate food, commodities, things like that. Uh, so, you know, it's just nice as well because then we get to get the gas fees and everything else for transactions. You're looking, to, you're looking to do the commerce on the blockchain too. So if I got a, a pallet of oranges and you want to buy it that transaction would be on the blockchain on on your system forget about that it's a blockchain but that will let you do the commerce uh, at some level except you got to define a coin on there so that i mean all this stuff gets super interesting um at that point yeah we have a coin already so i mean i, we, I can go into that i mean our coin is you know uh i'll tell you about the coin it, it's a little different uh, the people in my community probably some love me, some don't love me, but I'll explain it. But yeah, so you have a pallet of oranges. Somebody wants those oranges. You have an inspection certification. You got all the right documents uploaded, right? So it's all there. And then they have to upload their funds, right? So we don't we don't have the issue. You working on contracts when they don't have money. That money sits there on the blockchain, you know, in a wallet. Their stuff gets delivered. They inspect it. They have 24 hours to say, okay, I received it. And uh, then the money gets transferred to you, either through your wallet or through a, if you want to use a wire, you don't have to use a token. We don't care. And it just protects everybody down that whole chain. And if, you know, uh, rotten oranges show up, then, you know, there's, and it, there's a problem with inspection or certification or there's a delivery problem or something. But he rejects it. You don't get your money, so there's no sense in even sending fraudulent stuff. This is what I had to deal with in the, in the commodities business. You ask for a certain spec and something else shows up. And it's like, why'd you even send it? You know, but they've already gotten the money. Now you got to deal with the bank to recover the money or the inspection certification process to, to claw back that money. With this, it's, it's, it's pointless to even try to commit a scam. There's an escrow process here, but you need somebody to adjudicate that. You do need somebody to adjudicate because I could have sent you the right oranges and you're you're just refusing to pay. 
Yeah, yeah, they don't have a choice to not pay because if they don't release it within 24 hours, we release it. So you're right. There is a process for it, and that would be an independent third party to manage that. Um, you know, honestly, I don't know how big we can take it because I think once we have this thing working, it's going. I think there's going to be some large agricultural companies that will come along and say, hey, we want to license this or we want to take it over and stuff like that. And we're not – just like my robotics company, we never got into manufacturing. We developed the technology, and then we said, you guys build it, right? So the same process is what we hope is going to happen here. We'll take it to a certain point, but I'm never going to become a Dow. I'm never going to become one of these large companies that are, are trying to move food globally and stuff like that. We just want to give everyone access, equal access to the uh, uh, products globally, and then let them decide um, how. Uh, they're going to move the products, and uh, if it generates more farmers, more family farms that have more access to customers uh, and end users, then great, it worked. And then your revenue, your revenue model is going to be on a transaction fee and gas on the blockchain. Is that the idea? That's it. I mean, uh, agriculture is the number two industry in the world behind finance, right? It's like what sixteen trillion dollars a year. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a lot of fees. The problem with it is that it's just not sexy. You know, you talk about the problem with agriculture today, certification and processing. It's like you don't hear about the, I don't remember how, 12 million, you know, cases of, of uh, foodborne illnesses that go on. If you look on the website, you see all the stuff, you know, uh, I don't know, four or 500,000 people a year die from that, you know, and although it's horrible that 400,000 people died, they're not the problem. It's the, you know, the 80 million people that are tying up hospital resources that are sick that live. They're the ones that put the biggest strain on the governments to manage. And if all they had to do was just take time to make sure that the products that they're putting out was certified. So when we put a product out and you go through Agritech and you get that QR code, it's going to tell you exactly when it was harvested, where it was harvested, the inspector that had to log on and upload the, the document for inspection, the certification guy, the delivery guy, all the way to the supermarket. And then you scan it over there and you say, hey, OK, I, I see where my food is coming from. And then people can make choices based on that information. That's the traceability part. I think one of the bigger wins I've heard of with this sort of tech is when the salmonella outbreak happens. Because right now, a, a, a store has to throw every piece of chicken out instead of the chicken from that lot, right? And so we end up throwing a lot of food away at times when it was maybe a small lot that had the actual problem. Well, the thing is that there's no accountability, right? You hear these things happen. They throw all the stuff away. You know, it's a lot of these things could be, well, we know a lot of stuff is rubber stamped. But if you literally have to log in, put a user ID and password, <laughs> secure an interface on the blockchain, and you say, I checked this and this is good, now it's on you. We know exactly where the breakdown was. This is just going to help to identify and shed some light, a lot of transparency on the on the the products. And that's what we hope that happens with it. So um, that's what our goal was. I think last year I bid on a similar project. We, sp we spent a lot of time bidding on this project, actually. Um, we ended up not getting it because I was told we didn't get it because I wanted to use Ethereum. They wanted to use their own private blockchain. But that's for another day. The biggest problem I saw with this project was getting the farming date, getting the farmer, the tech, you know, you couldn't ask a farmer to type anything in my head. Like we were looking at bar tech, like you had to put something on the cow's ears and it had to be a scanner. And the moment you asked them to type something, you were done. Like it was just, it wasn't going to happen. Yes. Yeah, so our first version, you know, was quite intensive there's too much information that you're trying to collect because the more data of course then you know the more access uh you have to other markets um but you know we realized really quickly that farmers pretty much want to put their name and uh and what they're growing you know and maybe their harvest so we kind of kept it as simple as we could uh you know uploading the certification we made it so you could do it from a phone or a laptop or they can buy their little um, ipad or something to to load up uh, the stuff. But we wanted to keep it uh, very simple. So we have maximum participation on there. One of the other obstacles we were uh, looking at that people brought up is not all of these remote locations have 
access to Wi-Fi and things like that. And there's a lot of things that we can't solve. So you have some of these really poor communities that, you know, they, they're the ones that struggle the most and they're the ones that don't have access because the technology just isn't there. So we're hoping that, you know, as the uh, technology becomes available, they, this stuff will be available to them so they can have access to markets. I know that the there's a lot of uh, global organizations doing things to try to give access to stuff. So if, if they do get the access, um, you know, we'll help with everything else as far as the platform, certifications, licensing, uh, funding for the facilities, um, for the smart farming facilities and things like that, just so they can uh, produce and be profitable very quickly, as opposed to going out and trying to um, build a business and then looking for consumers and then, you know, it fail and it doesn't do anybody any good. So uh, we're hoping that by, you know, starting the registration process and giving visibility to consumers, that this will be like the, you know, the, um, Amazon for food type of thing, or, you know, Lazada or one of these other platforms around the world, Alibaba, where you are pretty much doing the same thing, manufacture direct to consumer, uh, except we are going to control it a little more because it is food. Um, and that's what we're hoping happens. And hopefully we're going to get some good help from some people as we build out. Well, if anybody can pull this off, I think with your background, it's going to be you, man. This might be your biggest logistical uh, problem to date that you're facing. And you're what, like a year? You're a year into building out the tech at this point? Oh, boy. Yeah, a year. Well, we had to build a statement of work and the scope of work and all that first. And then now we're, we're the programming's probably been about six months that we're working on program. So we're kind of, I don't want to say we're stalled, but the next phase of the peer to peer marketplace that is still to be funded. So we're, you know, working on trying to get funding in for that and, and do some things. Cause that's the big, that's where it gets really complicated. So now you're talking about global transactions using different fiat currencies as well as cryptocurrencies and what the laws are in those countries regarding the, 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 the use of money and things like that. So yeah, we're, we're, um, we're right in the process of that we did start our own token as you if you check you know agt token it's a rev share token so um it's not based on value of the token going up and down it's based on the revenue that we generate either through the cannabis or the energy or the uh or the um food when that's deployed we take our net revenue no one in the company gets a salary and then we disperse it and everybody owns tokens gets a proportional monthly salary. That that's where we tie into the decentralized generational wealth, as you would. So as long as this thing takes off and you have some tokens, and you know you're getting a monthly paycheck, that's the plan. Or or, or as we generate revenue, because we had one month, then we had another month. You know, we paid another month. We had a little hiccup somewhere in the middle. We have a um, a staking program. You're familiar with staking, right? So. Uh, we had a staking program where the devs stole the the money from the <laughs> from this. You know, we do you put it on the smart contract, and they have a back door. That kind of sucks. So now we're kind of recovering from that, and we should have a disbursement here. But the first first three months, we were paying about 22, 25 percent return on investment, which was nice. Um, the cannabis stuff, we we're a little slow. We're a little behind on our harvest, but. Um, you know, we have a really good model. We have a, a large facility here for cannabis. It's supposed to be our lowest hanging fruit. And we have an 8,000 square meter facility, about, you know, 1,000 pounds of, of uh, cannabis to, to sell. And uh, hopefully in the next two or three weeks, we'll start selling it and, and getting some disbursements going again for our, our holders. And, and um, yeah, we hope that works. You know, it's one of the only tokens that, that we don't want people to buy because it dilutes everyone else, right? So, so the, uh, they call themselves the DGENs, right? Everybody wants a token to take <laughs> off and they want me to put marketing in there. And then the, the, the people who are trying to just make a lot of money want it to stay low because they take their disbursement and then they reinvest it, buy more tokens and just keep doing this. So we don't do anything to market, to drive the token price up. We figure in about a couple of years when we're established, then the token will take care of itself. All of our liquidity pools are locked. All the, Oh, all the 100% of tokens are locked that aren't on the decentralized exchange. Everything's locked. So, so that was our plan to just give back to everybody that you know buy tokens and make money from it. All right, man. We are out of 
time, dude. This was, man, time always goes by so fast when you're having these conversations. It's, it's crazy. I could talk to you for another, like, two hours about this stuff. <laughs> I would have never expected this. He started talking about high school and, <laughs> and my military background. I was like, wait a minute here. I thought we were going to talk about, you know, vegetables. But, yeah, this was really cool living that studio. Yeah, so I, I appreciate it's you interesting. taking the time. You're in these crazy businesses, and but all of that military background and logistics is what gives you – for me, it gives you the street cred to be able to uh, pull these things off. Because the first thing my brain said is, how's he going to pull this stuff off? This is like a, like, and yet, and you talk about your military and I'm like, oh, oh, okay. There it is. I got it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's awesome. It's well All thought right. out. If anybody, yeah. if anybody wants to sort of get in touch with you after listening to the show for any reason, what what is, and we'll put it in the show notes, but and what is the best way for somebody to, to kind of ping you? I think the um, the email at Agritech. So we have um, www.agri-tech.com. Um, I'm sorry, dot .io, dot .io, not dot .com. I have Cannawell, which is C-A-N-N-A-Well, W-E-L-L, dot .com. So I think those are the uh, the best ways. So our, our Ramos at agritech.io or our Ramos at cannawell.com are the best ways to um, to reach me. You look up Agritech, you can get me on there as well by connecting. Go read the white paper. I mean, um, you know, it's like a 30-something page in depth about how we're going to do this, how we're going to deploy it, how the token works with it you know, how the cannabis ties into it, which is just another agricultural product, you know, the stuff we're trying to do globally. So um, right now we're just still building it out, funding the last part of it, and then hopefully we'll be ready to go. Yeah, so I, I want to talk to you again in two years and see where you're at in two years. And I I pray <laughs> you have this stuff deployed and it's working because it's important tech, but difficult tech. Yeah, maybe I'll have you out at a beach in Thailand. We'll be sipping some drinks on a, on the uh, clear water, and I could tell you about how we sold it all. <laughs> yeah, man, that that would be beautiful, dude. I, I, all right, I I really appreciate your time today, Robert. This is Bill and Robert Ramos signing off, and hope to see everybody again real soon.